I want to go back, circle back to the risk of statins. So statins, from my understanding, will reduce your cholesterol, but also kind of do that through the mitochondria. Should we go di dive into that? Yeah, sure. I think all the mechanisms of side effects aren't necessarily fully understood, but we do have good mm -hmm. data on the side effects and the prevalence of them. I've probably been maybe the most controversial doctor in the world in, in highlighting it and having backlash because of that. It depends what data you look at. So in terms of the way I describe it is, and this is what's important to patients, and you ask them the question when they come with a symptom and you think it might be a side effect, is this interfering with the quality of your life, yes or no? And the, the people will have usually have an answer for that. That's the first thing, so then you know mm. it's important. And the most common side effect from statins consistently in the literature and in my own experience is usually muscle pain and fatigue, Myopathy. which of course is not ideal. Mm. And of course that, you know, probably from some effect on mitochondrial, you know, uh, dysfunction, causing mitochondrial dysfunction. And it's also actually even some of the guidance on statins is that if people do intense exercise, then they will no notice that they're, not able to perform as well. So I, I'm pretty convinced that, that there is that accepted, even amongst the drug companies, they know that it causes mitochondrial dysfunction. But of course they will argue, well, hold on, it's got a, such a, a great benefit in preventing heart disease, so it's, it's worth it. Um, we can get onto that. In terms of prevalence of side effects, I would say, from my experience, I think at some point, probably, and it was reflected also in real world data, 20 to 50% of patients 20 to 50% of patients will experience a side effect that interferes with the quality of their life. And it can include things like stomach upset, cognitive dysfunction, erectile dysfunction, which is not nice, muscle cramps, of course, fatigue. The good news is, you know, I want to be, let's be completely honest with people here. Most of these are reversible within a few weeks of stopping the statin. And often, I, if you're not sure, I do it on a trial and error basis and say, listen, I think it's likely the statin. Let's see how I get on. And it's amazing how many patients come back thinking, oh my God, I feel like a new person. I thought I was just getting old or this is my life now. Mm. And they feel they've got a new lease of life, you know, within a few weeks of stopping their statin. And, you know, so then it's about an informed discussion about whether the statin's right for you. And in general terms, uh, Mohammed, I think we've discussed this before, but it's important to repeat these numbers because people get quite shocked by them. Um, if you are at low risk of heart disease, because most people prescribe statins are not in the very high risk category, at best, based upon industry-sponsored studies that have never been independently evaluated. And that's really important, really crucial. That's part of the controversy that's still ongoing, is that the raw data from all these studies has never mm -hmm. been independently looked at. If we trust the data from the drug companies, which we shouldn't, but let's say we trust them, best case scenario, over a five-year period, it gives you a one in a hundred chance in preventing you having a, a non-fatal heart attack or a non-disabling stroke without a prolongation life expectancy over that five year period. And when you tell patients that, most of them well, those are not great odds, mm. you know? And they'll say, well, I don't think I want to take a statin doctor. And I'll say, great, I support your decision if that's what you want. And they will often ask, well, is there anything else I can do? And of course, then you can talk about lifestyle changes, nutrition, stress reduction, et cetera. You know, it's interesting mm -hmm. because we're, we see on, on television, we're here in the literature, it's a 50% benefit or 75% benefit, but we know you need to look at the number needed to treat. Yeah. How many people do you have to treat for how long to get one person's benefit? Yeah. And what are going to be the number needed to harm? How many people are you going to hurt along the way yeah. to try to get to that number? And they are shocking for these raw data numbers. And yeah. the data for diabetes, in some studies, it's 8.9%. Almost 9% of people who take a cholesterol drug will develop diabetes directly from that cholesterol drug. But we feel that we're preventing a heart attack, so it's okay that we, we develop a diabetic. And as you mentioned earlier, there's primary and secondary, and I'd love your opinion on the data there. Does yeah. it prevent you from having your first heart attack? Yeah. Or if you've had a heart attack, does it help prevent a second one? Yeah, so you're, good question. So in the secondary prevention, so that people have had a heart attack or diagnosed with severe heart disease, the data tells us one in 39 benefit in preventing a further heart attack and one in 83 will have their death delayed or save their life because of the statins. It's really low, isn't it? it? And again, and it's not that great. And again, the other interesting thing, when I looked at the data carefully, is that, again, not independently verified, but these are in patients that did not get side effects. So what they did at the, a lot of the early trials is they removed patients with side effects before the trial began. Hmm. So you're reporting people without side effects. So when I tell patients, I say, listen, if you don't get a side effect, then this is your benefit. If I get a side effect, I made this point in my book, Statin Free Life, I would say that if you get a side effect, the likelihood is you're not getting any benefit from statin whatsoever. One even thing, that 183 figure. Mm. And something more interesting, 
which I came across recently, uh, David Diamond did a, a paper on this. They looked at the clinical randomized control trials in primary prevention and secondary prevention, two of them certainly, where they were looking at people's cholesterol profile mm -hmm. um, and looking about the benefit of the statin. And the interesting thing was in secondary prevention, you've had a heart attack. If your triglyceride to HDL ratio was normal to start with, there was no benefit at all from the statin whatsoever. What, what gets you a normal triglyceride to HDL ratio? Low carbohydrate diet. Diet, yeah. Or a low refined carbohydrate diet. Yeah, low sugar, etc. Circling back to your 9% <laughs> that have di diabetes, I mean, this is, this is our world lifestyle medicine, you know. We see, yeah. we see the role of nutrition lifestyle, so we're, we're believers in, uh, in this completely. 9% of people that have statins, why is that? What, what's the mechanism of action there, or the theory well, behind uh, it? Well, as Asim mentioned, is that different studies say different things. Mm. And I'm an internal medicine specialist. I like data. I like double-blind placebo-controlled multicenter international trials to give me a decision to decide what to do. But you have to look objectively, as you do the best job of, at how was the trial done, who did the trial, was the data released. It's very complicated yeah. in just making a decision. When you see the flash on TV, helps mm -hmm. one in three, helps 40%. You just have to be very careful of that. The little thing in your cell called the mitochondria, which takes food and helps you make energy, is directly sensitive and susceptible to those statin drugs. And it's dose dependent. And it's probably a genetic um, vulnerability that we don't really understand. Who's the canary in the coal mine that's gonna get the most damage from it? But the statin essentially poisons the mitochondria so that it doesn't make those as efficiently. We also know that there's some interaction in statin with the liver for some people. And your liver is kind of your detoxification factory. It takes all the bad things in your body, puts water on them or other chemicals on them so you can get rid of them. The statin interferes with both of those mechanisms in most people and some to the point where they have to stop the medicine. And so we use a nutritional supplement called CoQ10. We try to support the liver. We try to do lifestyle changes, keep the body moving, low carbohydrate diet, low refined sugar diet, the good fats, not the bad fats. So there's things you can do to hedge your benefit or potential risk by doing the medications. And if you look at all medications, they all do nutrient depletions and have other things that we don't really talk about. The blood pressure pills do, the blood sugar pills do, uh, and the statins certainly do. I was told by someone on the first clinical trial of statins that they saw the CoQ10 potential deficiency with statins and they were gonna put it in the drug but it cost a few pennies more per pill and decided not to. So it was on the radar mm. at the very beginning of this. Interesting. And then I see people coming to my clinic, it seems like the, their doctor just has one dose they like to use. And the, the doses in the States, 5, 10, 40, 80. I'll see these incredibly high doses that we can use a lower dose, a little bit of lifestyle change, and if someone truly needs it, and that's my, gonna be my next question to you, it seems, so get ready is that you can actually get by in most of your medications with a much lower dose if you're optimizing these lifestyle changes on your way to getting rid of them. Now, a lot of times you can't just stop a medicine and you shouldn't ever without your doctor's permission, but you can introduce lifestyle changes that help you reduce your medication and your burden from the medication. Yeah. And that markedly reduces the side effect profile and the, the danger with these drugs. Yeah, I completely agree. And in fact, that you know, there, there is a not one size fits all approach to this, whether you take a statin or not. You, I often, you know, speak to the patient, and it's sometimes a gray area. I say, well, listen, if you feel more comfortable being on statin, but you're getting side effects, let's try in a low dose. Let's do the lifestyle as well. You know, and then the, uh, and it's and it's a dynamic process. You know, yeah. one conversation with one patient at a particular time may then change several months later. You know, that's important. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, I would say to the patient, listen, we can come back to this and you mm -hmm. can think about it again and you may want to stop the statin and that's fine, yeah. right? So it's, uh, it's about treating the right patient with the right conversation, the right intervention at the right time. Let's talk about kind of when you would prescribe be it statin or other medication, Mark, in practice. You got high, a so we talked about apolipoprotein B being the subfraction that you're looking out for and lipoprotein little a as the subfraction. So... You see a patient that has high LPA. What are you doing and other kind of uh, risk factors? What are you, what's going through your mind? How are you going to approach that patient? Well, I, for me, it's a pattern recognition. And it's not an absolute number of any one marker. Mm. It's the pattern recognition. And you can have perfect lab tests and eat 
a bad sugar diet, not exercise, have a lot of stress, be a very angry person, and you're a higher risk than someone with the same numbers. So it's it's not just your numbers, it's yeah. the milieu that those numbers live in. It's the person those numbers live in. You can have great numbers, but take poor care of yourself and you're a huge risk, or have really bad numbers and do a lot of good things for yourself, and it's a different risk. So it's, it's not one thing equals one thing. And I really feel that this approach to lifestyle medicine, prevention, integrative, functional, everything we're calling it, and really with longevity, it's not living to 150. It's hiking and biking with your grandkids when you're 80. It's capacity. We were taught to get people to 50 and then watch them go to the nursing home in America. My patients want to be their best <laughs> today, and we wrestle every we'll year to keep left. them at that. What's that? We've we'll got four years left. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's this optimal vitality yeah. and this energy, and, mm -hmm. and um, all that's possible. But you do good medicine first. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, uh, and, and again, the lowest dose with the most benefit, okay. and you can use it as a leverage to get and encourage people to do the behavioral choices.